Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Researcher Miller, and the SCP we're going to be studying today is SCP-1936. Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures SCP-1936 is to be contained behind a 2-meter electric fence, which is to be patrolled by security elements. The area contained is roughly circular, one kilometer in diameter. Security cameras are to be installed to cover areas not currently being patrolled. Expeditions into SCP-1936 are to be escorted by an armed element as specified by Area 37's security director. Personnel are not to enter spatially anomalous locations without specific authorization, with the conditions of such authorization dependent on recent anomalous activity within SCP-1936. Area 37 is to be set up on the outskirts of the town to support these operations and to provide facilities for the initial testing and classification of objects recovered from SCP-1936. Once classified, these objects are to be sent to the appropriate site for long-term storage and study. Dead biological samples recovered from SCP-1936 are to be kept under strict quarantine and taken to Area 37. Summary incineration may be performed if the samples are deemed hazardous. In the event that any live biological samples are found in SCP-1936, investigating personnel are to remove themselves from the area and Mobile Task Force Zeta-29, Mad Mountaineers, are to be sent in to recover and bring it into containment. Description SCP-1936 is the New England town of Daleport. In the year 1997, the town fell victim to what is presumed to be a highly destructive event or series of highly destructive events over the course of several days. During this time, the Foundation was unable to enter the town or observe any event that occurred therein due to the presence of SCP-1936-1, a gaseous area centered on Daleport that covered the whole town. For further information, see Attempted Expedition 1936. This anomaly is no longer present at SCP-1936, having dissipated a week and a half after its appearance. Dimensions of the remaining buildings have become significantly altered from the original plans, and a large number of them have become topographically inconsistent. Investigations report spatial anomalies, including rooms that become smaller when they are entered eventually preventing the occupants from moving. Doors that lead to several points at different times of the day, and corridors that, despite leading to only one location, also lead to several different locations. No survivors from the anomalous events which affected Daleport have been found within the town proper, but the remains of a large number of Daleport citizens have been recovered. Cause of death varies, but it appears that a large number committed suicide. In many cases, the remains of these citizens demonstrate anomalous properties, presumed to be a result of the anomalous event. Some of these remains have included a smear of entrails and viscera capable of picking up audio radio transmissions from up to six miles away. Sound is created through vibration of tissues. Subject was found with a small plant that gave it a small constant flame. A torso embedded in a wall. Slight movement of the torso was visible when investigating personnel spoke. Blood continuously manifests 15 centimeters above the torso. The body of an older male with both eyes gouged out. A steady stream of ashes pours from the body's eye sockets, nose, mouth and ears without any apparent source. Several human corpses discovered in a row on the main street. Flesh, skin, and bone had been removed from a circular portion of their foreheads. Skin and brain tissue surrounding the wound had undergone severe charring. At 7.42 p.m. each day, several floating torsos manifest outside the Johnson Public Library, simulating the motions of running, heading southwest along Market Road. Three minutes after manifesting, the torsos attempt to leave the road and fade out. The body of a young female that floats steadily upwards when subject to any applied force, regardless of the force's direction. This is Attempted Expedition Log 1936. 
due to the unknown status of Daleport's residents, manned and unmanned expeditions were made into SCP-1936-1 to determine the safety of entering SCP-1936-1. Ascertain the nature of SCP-1936-1 and its effect, and to facilitate possible recovery of civilians. These expeditions took place over the course of several days as resources arrived on location. Attempted Expedition Log 1936-1 Unmanned Ground Expedition Procedure Following the detainment of relevant witnesses and the establishment of a containment perimeter, an unmanned ground vehicle, UGV-1, was sent into SCP-1936-1. UGV-1 was equipped with atmospheric sampling sensors, closed and open-circuit biological samples, including several Rattus norvegicus brown rat, instances. Video and audio recording equipment were also included. Results UGV-1 found SCP-1936-1 to be composed of sulfur, nitrogen, and carbon oxides. The concentration was found to be at a level where irritation occurs, but would not present a lethal hazard. Biological samples were unaffected in any anomalous manner. Video recording showed a smooth, wasteland-like landscape, starting at 100 meters into SCP-1936-1, and extending up to 2 kilometers from the edge of SCP-1936-1. At this range, radio communication with UGV-1 became degraded, and UGV-1 was returned to the SCP-1936-1's perimeter. Attempted Expedition Log 1936-2 Manned Ground Expedition Procedure: Two Class Ds, D-512 and D-513, were sent into SCP-1936-1 aboard UGV-2. UGV-2 was equipped with a higher wattage radio transceiver than that of UG-1. D-512 and D-513 wore Level A gas-tight hazmat protective clothing and biotelemetry sensors during the expedition. Results. D-512 and D-513 were initially taken one kilometer from SCP-1936-1's boundary. D-513 was ordered to de-suit. D-513 had been previously briefed on this and compiled promptly. D-513 reported no ill effects from exposure to SCP-1936-1. Medical telemetry showed D-513 had slight difficulty of breathing, similar to breathing smog. D-512 and D-513 continually reported flat, featureless terrain while in SCP-1936-1. Unacceptable levels of radio interference began at 3 kilometers from SCP-1936-1's boundary, and UGV-2 was returned to SCP-1936-1's edge. Medical examinations performed upon the return of D-512 and D-13 showed that they had not been abnormally affected during the expedition. Attempted Expedition Log 1936-3 Armed Manned Ground Expedition This is a recording, but the foreword is as follows. The following audio log is a recording of an attempted expedition by mechanized infantry platoon Kilo. The platoon was assigned six Piranha Lav-5 vehicles designated Alpha through Foxtrot, with mounted environmental analysis equipment. Log begins three kilometers into SCP-1936-1. Kilo Actual? Kilo Actual. This is Mike. Requesting update on your status. Over. Mike, this is Kilo Actual. We're still seeing the terrain is flat. SCP-1936-1 doesn't seem to have changed since we went in. Kilo Actual, this is Bravo Actual. We can see upwards incline ahead. This is Alpha Actual. We aren't seeing any incline. Check your mark ones over there, Bravo. Alpha, we're going down the incline right now. Alright, we see it. Following you down. Kilo Platoon, this is Charlie Actual. Anyone else seeing the sky out there? We're getting a lot of red and blue patterns. Seems to be screwing up the radio a bit. Uh, 
CNC. I think we're getting a little bit of inter... I said, amen. May that heretic burn in the pit. As in, I fucking hate him so much, I hope he dies a slow and painful death in a burning hole. At this point, two-way communication with the expedition team was lost. With CNC only able to receive messages, Sounds of a firefight and wildly varying descriptions of the attacking forces are heard. After approximately 30 minutes, the following message is received. This log also has a closing statement. Unmanned observations continued to operate, but were unable to reach the town of Daleport. No manned expeditions were sent into SCP-1936-1 prior to its dissipation. Recovered Materials, 1936 A large number of documents were retrieved from SCP-1936. These are assumed to have been written by the town's previous inhabitants. Document recovered from laptop in a residence in the southeastern quadrant of SCP-1936. Dear Diary, Today Mr. Sticky's arm came out of the closet instead of the window. It was even longer than ever, but it was still smoky when I touched it, so my hand hurts. Sad face. I told Mr. Sticky I didn't want any of his gross food today, and he got mad. He said it was vital to the incubation of the lava. I'm really hungry, so I ate the gross food, even though it was green and squirmy. I don't like Mr. Sticky that much. That was obviously written by a child. The following phrase was found in multiple locations predominantly in public toilets and stitched into the internal organs of mutated Daleport residents. I'm sorry that I could not save you. From Pangloss. Document recovered from a store in the southwestern quadrant of SCP-1936. Running out of canned fruit, but I guess that's the least of my worries. There was some more god-awful screaming and shit out there tonight. Screaming started off human. Think it was Lily from next door. Don't know what it sounded like by the end. Never heard anything that sounded like that. Thought I heard something trying to get in a while ago. It was Reverend Hawshore walking past my window again. Still ranting about God knows what. Managed to get a glimpse of him through the window. Wished I hadn't. He had too many spaces in him. Gotta leave. I think one of the big guys is coming this way. I can hear drums outside. I am the voice, and the voice is me. Security cameras and other video devices continued to acquire footage while SCP-1936-1 was present. Video recovered from a ruined gas station surveillance camera on the outskirts of SCP-1936. Start time is 9.39 p.m. 
The cashier of the establishment is handing a customer a plastic bag. The window next to the two individuals smashes. An unknown organism enters through the broken window. Its appearance is unclear, as its center is surrounded by multiple tentacle-like appendages. It is roughly the same height as an adult human. The customer attempts to flee. The organism lashes out at the customer with a tentacle. The customer is decapitated, and due to the impact of the tentacle, the head is propelled off camera. The cashier hides behind the counter, but the organism moves itself over the counter and out of sight, presumably having landed on them. Blood and viscera consistently splatter on the wall above the counter for the next 30 seconds. What appears to be an elderly human wearing a bowler hat and waistcoat enters the establishment. The footage becomes mildly distorted when the individual enters the shot, and increases greatly when it becomes apparent that instead of a face, the individual has a triangle branded onto their skin. The first organism moves back onto the counter, appearing to be wary of the individual. The distortion of the footage increases as several multi-jointed appendages burst from various points on the individual's body. The first organism and the individual engage in hostilities. The organism appears to be in a large degree of pain when touched by the individual and attempts to retreat out of the store. The individual throws the organism out of the store through a wall, creating a large hole in it. The ceiling is seen bulging downwards when the footage ends. Video recovered from security cameras outside the Johnson Public Library, facing Market Street. Start time is 7.40 p.m. A speeding car is seen entering frame from left, traveling along Main Street. The driver appears to lose control of the vehicle and crashes into a lamppost outside the library. As the lamppost is broken, it splits and buckles as a partially translucent spectral entity emerges from within the lamppost. The car's occupants leave the vehicle and begin running southwest along the street away from the entity. The entity gives chase, floating through the air. This goes on for several minutes, with the entity gaining little ground. Eventually, the entity stops giving chase and undergoes several changes in coloration. A blue-colored shockwave of unknown composition is then released from the entity and travels after the fleeing people. The shockwave passes over the people as they attempt to turn off the road, which causes the people to become transparent and fade. The following footage was pieced together from partially surviving sources centered around the entrance to the town hall. The exterior town hall is shown having sustained damage with the roof in a partial state of collapse. The front doors to the building are missing, replaced with a circular phenomenon glowing the blue-violet end of the spectrum. A convoy of vehicles appears traveling towards Town Hall at speed. The convoy consists of dozens of civilian cars and trucks, as well as Foundation vehicles matching those sent on the manned exploration of SCP-1936-1. A small number of humaniform robotic entities armed with the firearms of unknown make and manufacture are seen running alongside the vehicles. As the vehicles approach the town hall, the civilians and Foundation personnel disembark. The civilians move towards the circular phenomenon at the apparent urging of the robotic entities and Foundation personnel. A triradially symmetric organism, approximately three meters tall and covered in various technological items, is seen exiting the lead Foundation vehicle. The organism interacts with one of the devices and appears to undergo a series of controlled convulsions for several seconds. As the first civilians reach the circular phenomenon, a fractal-shaped sheet of modal skin jumps from the roof of the hall towards the crowd. Due to its low mass and high drag, this takes several seconds, during which the robots and Foundation personnel open fire on the skin sheet, doing little damage. As the sheet reaches the ground, it leaps towards the nearest civilian and wraps itself around the civilian's head. The triradially symmetric organism runs towards the two, rips the skin sheet off the civilian, throws it to the ground and activates a flamethrower, severely charring the skin sheet and rendering it non-ambulatory. The organism then indicates to several nearby stunned civilians to enter the circular phenomenon. They do so, 
causing them to disappear from view. The robotic entities and Foundation personnel allow all civilians to enter before collapsing inside the circular phenomenon themselves. When only the radial organism remains, it burns the phrase, Pangloss grants you sanctuary into the stonework above the town hall's entrance. The circular phenomenon remains in place as the organism leaves. The manifestation at Area 37 of 94 live civilians and of almost all of the missing Foundation personnel in the weeks following SCP-1936-1's disappearance is believed to be related to the above events. Individuals recovered so far have suffered memory loss regarding the events in Daleport, leading to no new information being gathered during the debrief. While analyzing recovered documents to determine the cause of SCP-1936-1's arrival, numerous references were made to a cult named the Victory Society. The following note was discovered in the jacket pocket of a recovered body. The head and left arm of the corpse had swollen to three times their regular size. The corpse is believed to be that of James Curtis, who was a member of a local religious organization known as the Victory Society. What we need. Two trout, a bottle of milk, virginal blood, in brackets, where am I even meant to get that, to be mixed with the milk, also in brackets, he who walks beneath dreams is into that sort of thing apparently. Assorted souls, willingly sold, and in brackets, alliteration is a big deal for that which waits inside the horizon. At least 200 beetles, lots of ice, and in brackets, if Hawshore thinks I'm doing the sculpture for this shivering mist thingy, he's got another thing coming. Two dead bodies have to have been dead for at least a year. Some human eyes. The blind one's meant to have thousands of sockets. I don't think a few eyes are going to do it for him, but oh well. Marky and Dan are getting the rest of the stuff. Laura too, I think. Hawshore just sits at home with his books though. The fuck. The following passage was written on the inside cover of a charred book, outside the church at the center of Daleport. The border of the mural is encompassed by civil sir the shivering mist that will descend upon the world during the time of awakening. The mist is all-encompassing and shall act as a barrier to those wishing to stop the awakening, as well as confine the great trinity of potential victors. The three at the center of the mural are the great victor of flames, the great victor of frost, and the great victor of the storm. They rain down destruction upon one another, with their true names inscribed in unreadable, unknowable runes. Around the three are visions of the great battle that contain the majority of those that shall come to this realm. With the Jur, the dark god of lampposts, the blind one illuminating the way for his followers who leave tributes upon crooked lightposts, Digilp manifests as the flies pouring out of the mouths of his beloved and becursed to assist in the conflict any way he can, while Nini, the trepanner, frees his followers from the skulls of their oppressors. The shredded cabbage of misfortune will destroy those who oppose their vegetable monarchy. Zin, herald of Marp, commands the army of Lepidoptera to carry those away who sleep with the flowers beneath the silver ash in the dream attics of Inanimatum. The voice of ages, though not visible, is omnipresent, represented by the yellow runes bearing his name hidden throughout the mural. Finally, at the bottom, those minor minions and deities pledge their allegiance to the three victors. Those who pledge their allegiance to the great victor of flames are tinted orange, great victor of frost, violet, and the great victor of storms, green. Many, such as he who walks beneath dreams, his face a mere triangle, remain unaligned, and are painted in black, for they are opposed to no one, and yet opposed to all. The dark deer Demax is shown around the edges, forever excluded by the rest. Sheogorath remains, ruling his kingdom of two faces before he himself brings its downfall, only to be stopped by a great prisoner of the Dragon King. Twenty goats stuck together making a goat ball 
spin around and round all the way to goat hell. The skeletons forever fight their final war. The conflicts of these minor deities will have little impact on who the great victor of this battle shall be. Several documents were recovered from what is believed to be the body of Reverend Michael Hawshore, the leader of the religious organization the Victory Society. The body showed extreme spatially anomalous properties. It was incinerated after recovery and analysis. It appears that these pages were removed from a journal or diary, but their original source has not yet been found. July 22nd. I am returning to Daleport. Godfrey wished me luck as I left, but I know he hoped for my failure. He is too idealistic to believe in my cause. I took all the necessary books out of the library before I left, though. I suppose I could have just waited until I got home, but I'm not sure if I'd be able to find a proper way there. And I very much doubt Godfrey would assist me. Hard to get all the books around. Had some trouble with the lost wanderer, the San Asad's seventh tome. But the container my contact gave me helped with the heat worries. Burnt my hand handling the thing, but still. You can't hope to do something like this without minor sacrifices. James is meeting me at the station, but he'll most likely be late. He always is. You have to work with what you got, but it's disheartening that there aren't some more respectable people interested in this venture. I worry about the next time. August 1st. I'm a little shaken up. The priming ritual for the One of Broken Nines needed blood sacrifice. I had hoped anesthetic could be used, but the ritual didn't allow for that. The child is dead now, and it is done. We can't lose track of the goal. The child would thank me, thank me from the bottom of his heart, if he knew why we were doing this. It's for the good of everybody. It's for the good of everybody. It's for the good of everybody. The victor shall walk from the rubbles of man and restore clarity to those who remain. I'm beginning to doubt James's devotion to our cause. August 13th. The voice of ages needed the blood of a heretic. I suppose it just means heretic in general. The voice wasn't picky about what kind of religion. James was not eager to contribute, but the fact that his blood worked proved that my suspicions were correct. The liar. He would have doomed us all in his selfishness. Things do not get easier, but my time is coming to an end. I have decided that we will not operate over the next two days. It will be a time for rest, so we can prepare for what is to come. I will welcome my death. Even if it's not quick, the world will lie still again on Monday, and it will thank us for it. Additional notes found near the body of Reverend Hawshore. The first of these appear to be a transcript from a speech made by the Reverend, presumably to the members of the Victory Society. Brothers and sisters, we come together for the last time today. It has been an honor to work with you all. I could not have hoped for a better group with which to secure the future of mankind. From the dawn of time, Terrible impossibilities have spawned from the darkness between stars, not hating life, simply being indifferent to it. We are ants to these abominations, these demented gods. I use this term as this is what they are called in older texts. You will not find any biblical god here. Or perhaps you will. I do not know. The use of gods here is the specific form of creature born from the primordial chaos of this reality. Not just a powerful being. Simply powerful beings do not reach the uncaring depths of cruelty and depravity that the gods do. They are so far above us that we are but insects. Accordingly, we shall look as such. In order to gain the forgiveness and the favor of the gods, we must learn to know our place before them. Each of these things seeks dominion over the laws of reality itself, imposing the nature of their twisted existences upon stars and planets and people. The only answer to this threat? These gods must be destroyed. The slate wiped clean. We could not do this. By no means. No.
but we cannot allow these things to exist. A kingdom cannot have a billion kings. We cannot kill gods. No. Only a god can kill a god. We will bring them here and bind them. Bind them until their bloodlust is sated. Until all but one is dead. Always a single god remains. The victor, who returns whence they came as the only god remaining. But their primordial chaos eventually spawns more gods. More twisted angels and demons. And so it all comes to pass again. Our vigilance must be constant, for a new victor must be found again and again. We will leave a mark in creation, but it will fade, it will heal. Stand strong as our people have before. Stand strong as the near men in ancient cities did. Stand strong as we did at the gates of Sodom. Stand strong as we have always stood strong, because this must always be done. Fortune favors those who take bold steps. We shall become unified with inanimatum, entering the Somnium Eternum. May we be forgiven. Sorry, I seem to have hammed that speech up a little bit whilst delivering it. It was purely for dramatic effect. I like to make these lectures more entertaining for you all. Moving on. The following section was found in the back cover of Hawshore's journal. And the victor shall walk away from the rubbles of man and bestow clarity, glory, and majesty to those who remain. From the red of my eyes, I see them. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And they see me. I do all of it right. And this is my repayment. I do not fear the rubbles of man. They are our glory, are our, I don't know what they are, I don't know what I am. My throat goes somewhere else. My throat goes somewhere else, and I do not like where it goes. In a war there is fire, but here the fire is cold, and sideways, and in the atoms themselves, in the minds even, because my headache like a nut that is cracking because of the baby bird inside it, I must clean my wounds, but my hands are made of wire and cyanide. I can see them towering, and they are nothing. They are the shadow of the tip of a fingernails. Fingernail! No, 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 no. To quell the titans for fire, ice, and lightning, we must eat babies and live happily ever after. It's not right. They're meant to be dead now. Not meant to be here, no. The victor shall walk from the rubbles of man, and others shall walk behind him. Video recovered from a camera found on a rooftop during an expedition near a church in the center of Daleport. Several entities of varying descriptions are visible engaging in hostilities with each other. Daleport's church is visible in the background, as the density of SCP-1936-1 is reduced for unknown reasons. A large creature of irregular shape which appears to be composed of large quantities of stone, soil, and what is thought to be some form of fungi appears several meters above the church. Camera begins shaking at this time. A sound akin to a distorted whale song is audible. The creature is estimated to be 50 meters in height. A second entity manifests above the church. The entity has a crystalline structure and a bright light is emanating from its central spire. A 15 second long screech is audible. Already manifested entities cease hostilities and quickly leave the area in a manner that suggests that they are fleeing. What is presumed to be a third entity manifests, but the camera distortion prevents an analysis of its appearance. A deep humming noise is audible for the duration of the footage, until it cuts out. Okay. Who'd have thought Cthulhu-like mythos was real, huh? <laughs> Yeah. Well, that about does it for today. Thank you all for listening, and you are all dismissed. Goodbye. A 
I would like to give a special thank you to André Bechert. Thank you very much, André. Your pledge is very much appreciated. If you would like to know how you can get a personalised thank you at the end of each of my videos, as well as some other really cool stuff as well, go to patreon.com forward slash the Vulcan. Thank you.